Aren't there a couple? Is there anybody who doesn't know where Edward's from? Okay, go Eli. All He's right. the so honest. There are people who don't know. So the people who do know, tell them. What can you tell them? Where's he from? Where's he work? What's his job? I have no idea. I've only been doing it for a couple of months. I haven't figured it out yet. All right. Well, there you go. He's a very honest man. But most, from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of all of you guys, I want to thank him for taking a week out to come out here, get in the wrong time zone, and take an enormous amount of time out of what he could be doing that earns a lot of money to, to help you guys. So thank you very much. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> and we, we looked long and hard and found an artist in the state of Washington who makes this amazing art. And this is, we felt, is a perfect gift to give someone who helps us see things differently. And I thought it's going to be a duck's t shirt. It's an artist. <laughs> so it's a kaleidoscope. Oh, oh wow. And it's All right. unbelievable. Reminds me of when I was in college. Sixties, <laughs> <laughs> it, it was the seventies. Anyway, okay, I'm gonna check this out later. This is great. Wow. You'll probably get the same. So take it away. Uh, wow, well, so I'm honored to be here. Thank you, uh, Richard Ward, and thank you, Deb Morrison, and thank you, all you amazing students who someday uh, I'll be probably asking you for a job. Um, probably won't be that far off. So <clears throat> I'm flattered to be here. And uh, I'm probably going to learn more this week from you than you're going to learn from me. But uh, Deb asked that maybe I sort of just share some stuff that may somehow be useful or, or give you a sense of what to expect. Um, so I really don't know very much about anything except what I've done and where I've been and how I got there. So I'll just tell you that story. How's that? Okay. I don't have anything in my teeth, do I? I came back from lunch today. I had something in my teeth. That means someone didn't tell me. Okay, good. All right. All right. So, so uh, as you can tell from my gray hair, I grew up in the 60s and the 70s. And the 60s and 70s were an amazing time. Um, incredible things happened. It was the golden age of media. This is probably hard for you to imagine. But 1960 was the first televised presidential debate. Isn't that amazing? Like in my lifetime, the first televised presidential debate. There'd never been one before then. Uh, the Beatles came to America. Actually, the Beatles didn't come to America. Ed Sullivan brought the Beatles to America, and there's a significant difference between those two things. The civil rights movement was, you know, in full stride. Uh, we were in the middle of the Vietnam War, which was a remarkable um, thing because obviously it catalyzed an entire generation. It began the beginning of all kinds of new, you know, freedoms and liberties and ways of thinking among boomers. But it also was the first war in which um, the press was genuinely embedded in the middle of everything. In, in all of America, every night at the same time, on only one of three television networks, because there were no other options, watched the body bags and the same story and the same reports all together at the same time and knew that everybody else up and down the street was watching the same news at the same time, you know, in their living rooms. Man landed on the moon, uh, and when I was in college, this really amazing thing happened called Watergate, and Nixon resigned, and Woodward and Bernstein were everybody's heroes. It was before investment banking got big, so when I was in college, people wanted to actually become journalists instead of investment bankers. Uh, and there was this other thing that happened, which was called the Creative Revolution. And a guy named Bill Burnback changed an entire industry by doing the simplest thing and saying, hey, advertising could be emotional instead of rational. And the way that we can come up with cool stuff is we'll get a writer and an art director, and they'll work together instead of separately. Because in the old days, you know, they slid the copy under the door, and the art director made a picture. Um, and all of that was big stuff. But what interested me more than any of those events was the media that brought them to life. Because there were only 10 people who controlled all the messages, all the content, what we got to think, what we got to know. 
And, and I grew up thinking, wow, this is like incredible. The newspaper, the television, etc. I want to be one of those people. I, I want to be someone who is in control and determines the content and influences other people and tells them what to think. So I wanted to be either Walter Cronkite or Bill Burnback. I didn't really want to be Ed Sullivan, but, um, but you know, like I said, he brought the Beatles here. Uh, and then, of course, Woodward and Bernstein. So I went, to, I went to a school not unlike this at Boston University, and I studied first film, and I said, oh, God, that's going to be too hard to be a film director. Then journalism, and I said, oh, God, I'm not a good enough writer. Uh, and then I switched to advertising. <laughs> Um, basically took the easy way out. And then I, I, my first job was as a newspaper reporter, and then I became a speechwriter, and then I ended up inside an ad agency, and first it was as a PR guy, then it was an account guy. Uh, and then eventually, uh, some of you heard my story earlier, I ended up in the creative side, and I made ads. And I was, I was lucky because I got in on this agency where there were 12 of us when we started out. None of us had any idea what we were doing. Um, and we built, you know, the 20th largest agency uh, in the country and did lots of famous stuff for Timberland and Swiss Army and LaunchMawson.com and the Super Bowl and all of those kinds of things. And I was doing exactly what I had wanted to do when I first decided I wanted to be one of those people who controlled the media and influenced others and told them what to know, what to think, what to believe. And fortunately, I survived 20 or 30 years in a business that typically spits out its young as soon as they're no longer young. But something you should stick in the back of your mind as you navigate your careers. Uh, because something really amazing happened. These four incredible media beast monster moguls all got replaced, right? So um, Walter Cronkite got replaced by, um, uh oh, I hope I'm showing the right presentation, by Zuckerberg. Hey, I know who it is. I'm just thinking that I might have opened the wrong deck, and we'll have to go back and start over again. Uh, and then we have Ed Williams from Twitter, and we have Steve Jobs, and we have Steve Chen from YouTube. Now, what's interesting about these guys is none of them are in control of anything, really, are they? What they have done, instead of being people who create messages and tell us stuff, they've actually liberated us. They've liberated every single person here to do what those other people did when I was growing up and become you know, a content generator or a distribution channel or a medium, or a blogger, or whatever. And all of a sudden, we have this crazy thing going on. And what has happened, now I know no one remembers this. Some, anyone old in the room remember this? Deb Morrison? Yeah. De you do? No kidding. <laughs> right, so this is a famous ad from Maxell, Maxell Tapes. And the guy's leaning back, and he's being blown away by the quality of those tapes. But the metaphor, of course, is in those days, that's all you could do, is you could listen. I always tell the funny story that when I was a kid, you know, you have to listen to the records in the order that the artist wanted you to listen to the music to. There's no such thing as a playlist. Uh, and now, of course, this has changed because now we are leaning in and we are controlling and we are making content and nobody tells us how, when, where to do anything. So there's a great uh, writer and professor at NYU called Clay Shirky, and, and he's written this book called Cognitive Surplus. And I think the line, this one line, to me, sums up the, um, the turmoil that everybody's going through right now, which is we're living through... The disorientation that comes from including two billion new participates in a, participants in a media landscape previously controlled by a small group of professionals. Okay, now to you guys may not think that's a big deal because you've been whatever you know blogging and tweeting and Facebook statusing and all of that kind of stuff probably for years, but you're going to get out of school and you're going to go to work for a bunch of companies who are still based on the old model, right? They're run by old white guys who you know, just like me, we're into the control side of things, who have muscle memory and organizations, et cetera, and it is really, really, really challenging. Um, so now let's talk about what are people doing, right? So now we've all been liberated, and the stuff that people are doing is actually pretty amazing. So I think it's more interesting to look at non-advertising kind of stuff and, and get our inspiration and learning from that. So here's the guy, I don't even know the story. He traveled around the world on Twitter. He's standing in line at a supermarket one day and says, hmm, I'm bored. I wonder, I wonder if I just tweeted out to someone, could they get me from London to Paris, if someone would just get me from London to Paris, and then from you know, Paris to, to Moscow, and then from Moscow to somebody. And just by tweeting, he went around the world uh, without spending a cent. People drove him, flew him, put him up, fed him, carpooled him, stuck him in the back of their pickup trucks, and he circumnavigated the globe doing nothing but tweeting every single day where he was and where he wanted to go. Strangers let him sleep in their house. 
with their families. And if you just think about that for a second, it's, it's crazy, but it's stuff like that that's actually happening, right? Anybody watch the Academy Awards last year to see the dance routine at the beginning? You know, the story behind those dancers is they all taught each other how to dance on YouTube, right? YouTube is changing education completely. We all know about TED.com. My daughter's 14. She does magic tricks. She learns them all on YouTube. My son takes classical piano lessons. I come home, he's playing Justin Bieber. He learned about it on YouTube. Um, YouTube is teaching us how to teach each other, and why not? You know, no reason why we shouldn't share our knowledge, get from each other. A kid starts a dance move in L.A., and he puts it online. And some kid in Tokyo sees that dance move and goes, ooh, I can riff off of that. So I'm going to take it to the next step, and I'm going to do something cool with it, and I'm going to video myself, and I'm going to put it on YouTube, and that's the challenge to the community to move on. And you have this amazing cross-cultural, cross-national you know, na national thing of these kids teaching each other how to dance. There's not a discipline of anything where this isn't happening in social media online. I heard the story on NPR a couple of weeks ago. I, I, I just had, had a baby. I can't uh, breastfeed my baby. I need some breast milk. No one really wants to pay big prices for, you know, a, approved breast milk. So there's this network of thousands and thousands of moms who are sharing and shipping their breast milk to each other. Um, the smart moms are actually checking out the blood tests of the people who are doing this to make sure they're not getting AIDS or something dangerous. But it's like, I'm thinking of this, I'm, and I'm in the space playing around with social media going, wow, this is amazing. There's like a, a self-created network of moms sharing their breast milk, right? That's pretty, pretty wild. Um, you know the story of Lemonade, the movie Lemonade? So a guy loses his job as a copywriter in Boston. Probably loses his job because cutbacks at the agency because they're not doing enough digital and social. So they get rid of, you know, the traditional people because they need more digital people. This guy's unemployed. He says, you know what? I've got to do something. I'm going to help people who are unemployed. He starts a blog. Please feed the animals. He then says, you know what? I think I want to try to make a video about people who are changing their lives. I'm going to do a little video. I've got a cheap video camera. I'll do it on YouTube. I'll seek out some help and support from other people. He posts something on Twitter, and the next thing that happens is people start saying, hey, I'll, I'll help. Sony Pictures donates a camera. A production company donates a crew. He sends me a request and asks me if I will tweet to Virgin America and ask them if they'll fly the crew from Boston to LA so that they can shoot people on the West Coast. I don't know anyone at Virgin, and I at the time have a few thousand followers. I tweet to Virgin America, and within a half an hour, Virgin America agrees to fly the whole crew to L.A. for free. And he ends up making a movie called Lemonade, which, of course, has met with critical acclaim, played in a lot of, uh, in a lot of uh, uh, theaters and exhibits, et cetera. And then he said, you know what? Shit, I'm going to start a, a business doing this. And now I'm going to do a, a movie about the resurrection of Detroit. And now I know a little bit about social media. I'm going to do something more interesting. I'm going to go on something like a Kickstarter, and I'm going to crowdfund. I'm going to raise money. And the way that I'm going to raise money is I'm going to sell frames of the film before it's even made. A dollar at a time, a dollar at a time, a dollar at a time. After a couple of months, he's got $28,000. He's well on his way to having some money to make a movie. He doesn't need a producer. He doesn't need an agent. He doesn't need funding. He doesn't need anything. He can do it all himself. It's awesome, right? You guys know the story here? It gets better. Everyone know the story? So um, I won't go into it, but if you don't know if it, it gets better, you should check it out, right? So the reporter bummed out about, you know, gay kids not, you know, committing suicide or being depressed about what's going on. No one, no one talks to kids about that. So he says, I'm going to start a YouTube channel. I'm going to make a video of my own life, how it sucked when I was gay. I got, I got abused. I got harassed. But you know what? You go to college. You find a community. You meet people who will like you. And it gets better. And the next thing you know, hundreds of people, companies, Googles and Netflix and, and um, you know, organizations of employees are uploading videos. Then Obama's doing a video. Then Hillary's doing a video. And the next thing you know, there's thousands of videos and millions of views. And one guy, who happens to be a columnist, there's a little bit of fun, but one guy, one guy in a video camera and YouTube makes this thing happen and begins possibly to change a country's mindset, a generation's mindset, offer hope to people, um, et cetera. So, Doing all kinds of things. I, you, you may or may not know that you know we're using the stuff to take down countries and governments. And this whole thing started on Facebook and Twitter. And here's a bunch of tweets from whatever uh, January 18th, so seven days before everybody went onto the streets in, in Egypt. This thing started with a half a dozen comments on Twitter. And the next thing you know, bingo. Who knows Gary Vaynerchuk? Anybody know Gary Vaynerchuk? Everybody knows Gary Vaynerchuk. So um, if people don't know Gary Vaynerchuk, I'll tell the story fast. Gary Vaynerchuk, you don't know 
Vaynerchuk. You should know Gary Vaynerchuk. Okay, so here's a guy. <clears throat> it's such a great story. Um, he inherits this little liquor store from his dad. And uh, he, he's in New Jersey. The store does a couple million bucks of sales a year. And he knows nothing about advertising, marketing, anything. He knows a fair amount about wine because he worked in a wine store stocking the shelves all his life when he was a little kid. But one day he sees a YouTube video and he goes, wow, a YouTube video. Some guy just made a YouTube video and all he had was a folding table and a video camera. Maybe I'll make a, a, a YouTube video and maybe I'll make it about wine because I know something about wine and maybe I'll make it for the common man because I'm from New Jersey and, uh, you know, screw this Enafiel thing. And so he makes a video and he sticks it online. And then he makes another one and another one and another one and another one and another one. And um, after a while, he's got thousands of people watching his videos, then hundreds of thousands of people. Then his sales go from $4 million to $8 million, then they go to $12 million, then they go to twenty, then they go to sixty, then they go to $80 million a year in sales, all, you know, um, online. Uh, then Dow Jones offers him a multi-million dollar contract to write a book or a series of books on how he did what it is that he does using Twitter and Facebook and YouTube. And if you saw the guy, you'd say, shit, he's like a used car salesman. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Wine Library TV. I am your host, Gary Bay Ner Chuck. And this, my friends, is The Thunder Show, a.k.a. the Internet's most passionate wine program. So this guy, if you're in advertising, you look at this guy and you go, he is a hack used car salesman from... You meet him in person, he's one of the most inspirational people I've ever met. I know people who have spent an evening with him, and the next day they quit their jobs and they started companies because he's so compelling in what's possible using this new stuff. So um, on and on, and people are creating sustainable companies. Anyone know the Uniform Project? Okay. Uh, here's another great story. Designer at an agency in New York. Um, she wants to do something for charity. She grew up in India. So she says, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to design a little black dress. I'm going to wear the same dress every single day for 365 days. I'm going to accessorize it differently. I'm going to invite my friends to send me scarves and belts and bags so it'll look. And the point that I want to make is I can wear this dress every day. And for doing that as a sacrifice, I'm going to ask you to send me money. And the money's going to go to send kids to school in India because so many kids can't go to school in India. There's not enough money. She does this thing. And all she has is, a, is Twitter and a Facebook, a blog, and a YouTube, and, and doing it all by herself. And then word, word gets out. And, um, and then people start sending her stuff. They send her stuff from thrift shops. They send her scarves and they send her bags and they send her money a little at a time. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden the media catches on, the offline media. And she's written up in the New York Times and then she's on the Good Morning America show. And then this thing starts to get really crazy. And the next thing you know, she's raised $105,000 in five and ten dollar increments online to send kids to school in India, right? Just wearing the same dress every single day. So then she goes, oh my God, this is consuming me. And everyone tells her there's a business in this. She quits her job, okay? She quits her job. She starts a company called The Uniform Project. And the idea is I'm going to get a, an emerging celebrity every month. I'll design a dress for that person. The proceeds will go to that person's charity. We'll sell the dress. We'll sell the accessories. And what I'm going to do with this, I'm going to, I'm going to redefine the future of business. I'm going to show, first of all, that you can simplify your life and still be expressive, that you can downsize, that you can buy products that are only environmentally friendly, but more importantly, I'm going to show that business and marketing and advertising can change the rules, go from traditional to new stuff, be all about sustainable, and I can create a business with a social conscience, right? And I look at that as someone who's been in that, in the other, you know, side of things, right? Selling other people's products to other people's customers with other people's money. And I go, wow, that's like really, really awesome. That's exciting. So I want to either go do that or I want to learn from that and bring that into my business, right? Um, so here's an example of what she's doing right now. New dress every month. Boom, boom, boom. Check out uniform project. Buy yourself a little black dress. Donate some money. Let's make the logo bigger. You've heard the stories about this. This is what clients want you to do, right? 
Make the logo bigger. That's all they care about. Make the logo bigger. Why do you want the logo bigger? Because I want them to know it's my ad about my brand and I'm talking to them. What's interesting about all the stuff we just saw, though, there's no logo because there's no brand because we don't need a logo and we don't need a brand because we don't need a client because we don't need a company because we can do all the shit ourselves, right? And that's also pretty interesting for us who are in the business of using all of these things for commerce and now we have to rethink what we do. We're not going into the business to be in control anymore. We don't control anything. We're not going into the business only to be the master storytellers. No one needs us to tell stories anymore. They'll listen to them if they're really, really good, but it suggests there's all kinds of interesting stuff going on. So, um, in fact, when there is a logo, sometimes it isn't even us doing the work, right? Everyone knows the story like this guy. No one knows who this guy is. He still hasn't been out yet. He takes over the BP Global PR thing on Twitter, right? Um, the very first tweet was something like, we're sorry to report something terrible has happened, right? And then <laughs> this guy's one of the funniest guys in the world, but this thing goes, oh, there it is. Regretfully, something has happened on the golf course. goes on and on and on. Um, and he, uh, he ends up with, you know, 186,000 followers on Twitter. And, and, and real BP has something like 8,000 followers on Twitter. So, so where's the logo? We don't need to make the logo bigger. In fact, I'm going to use your logo and I'm going to be the guy, right? Cliff Freeman, one of the greatest ad agencies of all time. Um, they did stuff like Where's the Beef, Little Caesars, Wendy's, okay? All kinds of amazing stuff. Shut their doors, closed down, went out of business last year. Why? They made TV commercials, and they only made TV commercials. They made them better than anybody, but no one's buying this much anymore. Meanwhile, while the best fast food advertising agency in the world goes out of business, some guy with a roach coach, a few too many drinks in him one night, decides we should make, you know, taco flavored, I mean, uh, Korean flavored taco something or other. Drive him around a roach, yeah, whatever. What were they? Korean Mexican, Korean Mexican taco, right? Barbecue yeah, or something. They do, see, and there we go. So he starts a business with a Twitter handle. And, and the, way, the reason that happens, he's driving around, stops at a bar at midnight, everybody's getting out of the bar, they got the munchies, he sells them one of his, one of his tacos, but the next week they're all pissed off because the truck's not there and no one knows where the truck's going to be. And his girlfriend says, you know, if you just got a Twitter account, you can tell people where you're going to be and when you're delayed and what time you're going to arrive, and then everyone can be there and all lined up, ready to go. So, um, you know, crazy stuff. And then inside our own business, people who we respect and admire, like Alex Bogusky, uh, have forsaken the old of selling burgers and uh, and pizza and decided it's time to start this, start my own thing, seed new ideas, social innovation, because I can and because I have a network and because I'm connected, et cetera. So, um, wow. Are you guys scared yet? Are you worried that you're going into the wrong business? <laughs> Don't be. This is still the best business to go into and the best time to go into it. Technology has messed with us forever, right? When Gutenberg invented the printing press, the scribes were screwed. And, um, and there's that funny story about someone decided, I forget who it was, we've got to save the scribes. They're really, really important. I mean, it's an art form, and, and, and it's important. But I've got to get the word out to save the scribes before the printing press takes off. How am I going to get the word out really quickly? I'm going to have to print it on the printing press and then get it out. So, I mean, the, the contradictions are crazy. And there's always people resisting stuff, but they shouldn't resist. They should embrace things. Um, and there's panic in our industry right now, right? So this was an article that was in uh, Fast Company a little while ago. Mayhem on Madison Avenue. No one knows how to get digital and social. The old agencies are in trouble. The carnage is going to be awesome, right? I mean, so do you guys see this article? It's hysterical. Um, and it was probably was like half true and half, you know, inducing panic. Um, but it's partly true. Um, there's some journalists in here. I think you know what's happened to newspapers. About 180 of them went out of business in the last couple of years. Power records, right? What happened to the music industry? Cliff Freeman's gonzo, and I love that picture. How, how perfect is that to have a Hearst park in front of a blockbuster video, and we all should have bought stock in, in Netflix at least after we pay off our student loans. Um, do you guys still study Marshall McLuhan in communication schools anymore? Do you? Marshall McLuhan? Do we still study him? Well, he's an old guy. We studied him when I was in college, but he's worth reading because like Bill Burnback, who said all these prescient things, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, a lot of what he talks about still makes sense today. And this is one of my favorite quotes. Technologies are not simply inventions 
which we employ, but the <coughs> means by which people are reinventing, right? So all of our customers and targets and markets and all the guys are reinventing themselves or being reinvented or having the opportunity to do that. So what we have to do as marketers and content creators and storytellers, we have to reinvent ourselves, right? We have to learn a whole bunch of new skills. Someone was asking us earlier, well, what happens to creative people? You know, when, what do we move from? So, um, so I don't know a lot about art history, but I thought this was actually a pretty interesting example because we are, in one way or another, we're all artists, right? We're all creative. And artists have actually been pretty good at dealing with technology because if you think about before there was a camera in the late 1800s, art was incredibly realistic, you know, and, and accurate representations of stuff. We painted what things looked like. And then the camera came along and it's like, oh shit, we don't need to do that anymore. Cameras can show us what things look like, so <coughs> what are we going to do? We're going to do something different. I'm, I'm not among the we, but I'm just, you know, a little liberty with it. What do we think? So someone said, hey, well, we can tell people what things feel like, can't we? We can make art that's about what it feels like, not what it looks like. And then, of course, I jumped all the way, you know, forward to like, you know, uh, Cubism and, and Picasso and stuff. But that's essentially what happened. The camera wasn't something that like made people flip out. It was, it was something that got them to rethink, you know, their own world based on the interactive <coughs> technology. So that's what we need to do. That's what we need to do. That's what you guys need to do. That's what, by the way, what I'm expecting you to do, because we need people like you inside our companies to help save us from doing the same thing over and over again. So the question is, do you look at the technology? Do you look at the platforms? How do you decide how to change? And, and I always say, no, no, no. We look, at, we look at users. We look at people. We look at what consumers are doing with content. And I'm going to tell you they're doing eight things. There's eight things that matter. They haven't changed for three or four years. I'm totally convinced of this regardless of whatever technology comes along. The consumer wants to create, number one. The consumer wants to create. We have to accept that, acknowledge that, etc. Sometimes they want to create really stupid things like haul videos. I want to know, are there any women in here who make haul videos? Any of you guys shoppers out here on the West Coast? No? You know what these are? All right, so, you know, some things are stupid, but, you know, they were fat. But if we're smart, like J.C. Penney, you know, you guys are working on J.C. Penney. J.C. Penney hires haulers, gives them free gifts cards, the haulers go shopping, they make haul videos about J.C. Penney. How smart is that, right? Second thing is, we have complex relationships with media. Nobody just reads anymore. Nobody's just online anymore. We watch the inauguration on Facebook with our friends. We watch the, 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 the Super Bowl, and we tweet about the ads. Number three. Um, community is our new source of content. Um, you know, we check our Facebook feed. That's our news. This is my um, my flip board, and I can access content. As you see, I've got Deb Morris, and I read whatever she tells me to read up there. Um, and But the people that I follow and interact with and pay attention to, those are my most important sources of content, not necessarily the editors of the New York Times, despite the fact that I love the New York Times. We're constantly connected to them. That's a subset of the previous one. We want to do business with a person, or at least a brand that behaves more humanly. If you go all the way back pre-industrial age in the marketplace, when we went to the marketplace on weekends and we bought you know, meats or cheeses or clothes or whatever, we did business with a human being. And we knew who that person was. And then industrial age came, and then we moved to the suburbs, and then we shopped in big supermarkets. And one of the reasons brands got invented was because we no longer know the person who's making our food. So we'll put little Keebler elves on the package because I'll feel really connected to the Keebler elves. They've got like this human quality to them, et cetera. And, and that's where brands came from. But the fact is social media is bringing us back to wanting to be able to connect with people. And it's important that brands and the marketers therefore think about acting and behaving that way. Um, we join forces to exert influence. How does Betty White get on Facebook? How does the Gap logo get wiped out? How does Michelle Lauto, a 17-year-old in New Jersey, get every student in the state to walk out in protest of tax uh, cuts for the school system? It's the ability to harness a community. I grew up in the days of Kent State and the moratorium on Washington. You know how hard it was to tell everybody what the hell was going on? Hey, let's all take a bus down to Washington and protest. It's so much easier now, and people are taking advantage of that kind of stuff. There's no such thing as perfect. Okay, because we can all opt into content in our own terms, um, there's no one <coughs> thing that makes sense for everybody. And what's really stupid about the advertising industry, you know what we do? We spend, someone talked about the $30,000 in research today. We spend $30,000 in research to go find a single insight, a single insight, and then we're going to make an ad campaign that costs a million dollars, three commercials, they're all going to be the same. We're going to run those things to all say one thing to a whole bunch of people 
when the same message to everybody isn't relevant anymore because we can all opt in on our own terms in our own way. We need to be way more diverse in how we get stuff out there. Uh, new definition of quality is number seven. When I went to college, we had multi-million dollar stereo systems. They filled up our dorm rooms, right? We had, you know, we were trying to replicate um, concert hall sound. And of course, what you guys care about is uh, portability, accessibility, availability, you know, and, and inexpensive, right? And so we go around with buds in our ears instead. And finally, attention is the new scarcity, right? Um, when, when you go to work, I don't know how many emails a day you get now, but man, go to work, you're going to have 300 emails a day, you're going to have 1,500 tweets in your stream, you're going to have people sending you links and shit to look at, you know, on and on and on and on. These are stuff that you inherently know, but you may not yet have thought about it from the perspective of a marketer, which is what you need you need to do. So we have these eight issues and um, they're transforming everything. <coughs> and transformative markets and comics never survive. You can look at all the people who are like, you know, by the side of the road. Um, you know, we, we looked at some of those earlier. So what we need to do is change. Um, and you guys inherently know some of this. I think it's smart to think about this. You're going to go to work for companies, some of whom get it and some of whom haven't yet. Here's what I think we need to do. We need to change our mindset. As marketers and communicators, this is always and probably to some degree what we've been taught. We're going to identify our audience. We're going to craft a message. We're going to target them with that message. You know, shoot an arrow through the heart. We're going to have a media plan. You know what a media plan is? A media plan is I'm going to decide when my content and my message is available. Between January 30th and March 30th is my media plan. Shit, you're not interested until April. What happens, right? Makes a lot of sense. And then we try to penetrate the market. These are all like these aggressive football kinds of terms. You know that old George Collins routine, the difference between baseball and football? Football is played on a gridiron. Baseball is played on a playing field, right? So um, we need to get more like baseball. And we need to think in terms of a community and experiences in inviting people to participate um, and having an interest plan so that even though you not care about what I have to say till April, that we're still there and available for you. Uh, and we need to get better at collaboration. Right? Not penetration, but collaboration because everyone wants to create content and they want to be part of this thing and they want to share and pass it on. This is a huge, huge mindset shift for marketers uh, and advertisers. Um, so uh, another thing to think about, I think a lot of us have talked about this today, um, art and copy is what advertising is all about. Right? It goes back to Burnback. We talked about Burnback earlier today. Well, User experience and engagement might be the new art and copy. Okay? How can you be as creative in how you let a consumer <coughs> interact with you and your brand as you can about that really cool headline and picture you put together to make somebody go, uh, aha. Um, and there's some interesting examples. So this is one of my favorites. I talked to some of you guys about Made by Many, very cool digital company in London doing some great stuff for Burberry. So I'm over there a couple weeks ago, and then my friend Tim is telling me a story about an assignment from Skype. Skype wants to get more teachers to use Skype in the classroom as an educational tool. What would an advertising agency do? What would an advertising agency do? Um, advertise Target. to teachers. That's right. That agency would make ads and advertising to teachers in all the educational journals. You know what these guys did? They said, no, 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 let's talk to some teachers. We're going to figure some stuff out. And they figured out that teachers already know about Skype, and teachers like to Skype, but teachers don't Skype enough because why? They don't know who the hell to Skype with. So an ad agency could figure that out too, and then an ad agency would go and run ads to try to get people to learn who to Skype with. Instead, these guys said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to build a directory. We're going to build the most amazing, super cool directory in the world. It's going to let every single teacher who wants to Skype with someone go on there and write about what they who they want to Skype with, and we're going to invite digitally Anyone who has content and something to share and a speech to deliver, science, social media, you know, journalism, whatever, to go on Skype and make themselves available. And we're going to let these people connect and we're going to use what's called the network effect, right? The network effect is why Twitter is so big and Facebook is so big and YouTube is so big because those brands didn't do any of the work at all. They built something that lets the community do all the work themselves, build it, grow it, share it, spread it. So they're going to create a directory that will itself enlarge the entire experience of Skype in education. And that's the difference between advertising and user experience and engagement. These guys are smart. That's the future way of thinking. I still like to make TV commercials or watch them or whatever, but I think it's important that we learn how to think um, that other way. So uh, a couple other things we should do is we should change what it is that we make. Okay? 
How's that? That's a great ad. Is that a great ad? <laughs> like, if you made that ad for an advertising class here, and the assignment was for a zoo, um, you know, wouldn't you get a good grade, right? So if you can't see it, it's like a lion has climbed up. Uh, uh, a zebra's climbed up on the top of a giraffe's neck, and he's up there holding on to dear life, and the headline says the lions are coming, right? So it's an ad to introduce the lions exhibit, right? So, you know, that's good for an ad. But this is what the Antwerp Zoo did when their elephant was going to have a baby. <laughs> Sound of the baby elephant, and they shared it with everybody, so everybody could see the proud moms, you know, baby. Mm -hmm. Then they crowdsourced the name of the baby elephant, and they asked everybody, "Hey, submit names," and everybody who submits names, they'll let you all vote on what name should live, and this goes on and on. Interactive, engaging, not a single traditional creative execution in there. I may have my numbers wrong, but if I remember correctly, traffic at the zoo went up by like 300,000 visitors you know, in a year. The whole country was talking about this thing. Everybody was following the birth of this baby elephant. And I don't care how good an ad they made about the coming of a baby elephant. It never would have generated that kind of stuff. I think we have to change how we make things, right? In our business, <coughs> we make things the same way all the time. We have a strategy, we brainstorm, we develop some concepts, we put the concepts on the wall, we show the concepts to the creative director, the creative director doesn't like them, we do some more concepts, we put them on the wall, the creative director finally likes them but doesn't like how they look, we redesign them, we make them nice, we take them to a focus group, we show them to the client, we go down this long linear process, right? It's like Henry Ford manufacturing. And then we, something comes out the end, and we just pray to God that the thing works, right? Well, there's this new thing called Lean Startup, um, which is more iterative. It's sort of like learn, test, iterate, learn, te test, learn, iterate, test, learn, learn, test, iterate. So it's the idea of like, let's make stuff faster. Let's make stuff faster and put it on the internet. Let's make stuff faster, put it on the internet, let people play with it. Let's not be afraid of showing our ideas early. Let's get reaction, and then let's build it. Because in the digital space, we don't have to be finished when we put something out that we can hide on the internet. It's like walking outside in Manhattan. You can be on the streets of Manhattan and no one knows who you are. You can hide on the internet. We can use the web as our new social group, uh, as our new focus group. We can use the web you know, for experimenting. We use the web for building. Um, we should, um, so here's this, th uh, here's this thing. I talked to some people about this say, Go check this out. It's called Art of the Trench. Artofthetrench.com, one word. Just check it out. It's one of the coolest digital, um, experiences and it sold uh, a gazillion trench coats um, and it's really a very very cool thing but I, I won't go into it because um, I've got more stuff to go through. We should change the speed with which we deliver it, right? Everybody knows about 12 force. Again, um, we're in this real-time world. Consumers, when we talk about, talk about consumers, they don't want to wait. They don't want to wait for next month's magazine to come out. They don't want to wait till next Thursday when something's on television and if they have a question or a desire to interact, they don't want to wait until tomorrow. What's the worst thing in the world? Being on hold on that cell phone, on that, on that phone, 800 number, right? So we've got to learn how to do more of this kind of stuff. We've got to learn how to, how, to, how to mobilize our employees and to liberate them and to inspire their participation and not so, be so afraid that, oh my God, how can we let everybody in the company talk to our customers? Uh, shouldn't we leave that in the marketing department? Um, we need to actually change how we distribute content. I, I talked about this at lunch today, so this is really interesting. And I think this is a whole model. It's a combination of gaming dynamics and new ways of influencing people, right? So Uniqlo is a retailer. And what do all retailers do? They put shit on sale, right? They all put stuff on sale. Everything gets marked down by 40% or 50% eventually. We know that that's going to happen. But why should we ever do that again, ever? Why should we put something on sale all by ourselves? Why not make our customers think that they're the ones who are putting it on sale? So what Uniqlo does is they put their sweaters online and they go, hey, if you tweet about this sweater, if you tweet about it, the price will go down a little bit. And if you get your other friends to tweet about it, it'll go down even more. And if we get X number of tweets, this sweater is going to go down by 50%. <coughs> so what happens? Well, first of all, if you want that sweater, you're going to tweet about it. And then you're going to tell your friends to tweet about it. And then people are going to tweet about it just because they go, whoa, I have the power to reduce the price. Uniqlo is going to reduce the price anyway, but what the heck? I feel like I'm reducing the price. 
So I'm tweeting away, and what are they getting? They're getting so much free advertising. It's all over social media. People are tweeting, they're posting to Facebook. The price is going down. I feel like, yeah, that went down because of me. And what are they getting? They're getting all kinds of data. They go, huh, that's really interesting. This price went, th this sweater went down faster. People must like this sweater. Let's make sure we have more of them in inventory. I mean, this is a whole <coughs> new way of thinking about marketing. And again, if you look at that, you go, what's the creativity? It's not a headline, it's not a picture, it's not an ad, it's not juxtapositional reasoning. It's a new way of, of, of user engagement. Um, we need to change how we invite participation. Um, I love what Ford did a, a year and a half ago with Ford Fiesta. And they, they just essentially they gave the car you know, to 100 kids. And uh, they had to apply to get in. You had to be a social media content creator, make videos, et cetera. But if you got in, they gave you a car and it was yours for like six months. And you could drive it wherever you want. Gas was paid for, everything was paid for. You had to fulfill some assignments, and you had to do some tweeting, and you had to do some Facebooking, and you had to do some YouTubing. So you're generating content. But what they're, they're learning is the lifestyle, the practices, the behaviors, and the interests of their community of prospective customers, and ending up with tons and tons and tons of data that's way more realistic than a contrived focus group for how to market this thing later on in the future. We should change our technique for telling stories, right? Again, we talked about this a little bit. We need to get better at getting other people to tell our stories for us. We need to get them involved in creating those stories with us. So in a couple of weeks, um, there's going to be a new book out called The Art of Immersion. And it's going to be by Frank Rose, who's an editor for Wired. And he's going to, in this book, he talks a lot about this new kind of immersive storytelling. Um, it's, it's more complex. It goes transmedia. Uh, it's really, really interesting kind of stuff, and it, it connects the entertainment industry, user behavior, gaming dynamics, you know, and storytelling. So, anybody watch True Blood TV show? I don't. Do you like it? Yeah. The launch of True Blood was brilliant, and one of the early transmedia storytelling things, and a little bit about what Frank Rose is talking about. So. Um, you all know that whenever there's movies and, and TV shows, they always get launched with these big campaigns, the size of buses and the billboards and the tune and stuff, etc. True Blood goes to this tiny little company called Advanced Guard in Massachusetts and goes, hey, yeah, how can we do this and we don't have any money? So this guy at Advanced Guard gets together with an, another little company and they come up with this thing, which is like totally cool. They go, okay, here's what we're going to do. <coughs> we're going to mail vials of synthetic blood to all the most prolific content creators that we can find. So we're going to find bloggers and tweeters and video bloggers, and we're going to send them a vial of synthetic blood with a little quiz challenge to see if they can crack the code and get into the, the, to the lair. I don't know, is that what, I, I don't know what word vampires live in, but the lair of vampires and identify them and see if they can get released beforehand. Now, you're a blogger or a video blogger, or a popular person on Twitter, and you get in the mail a vial of synthetic blood and this challenge. What do you do with it? You blog about it, and you make videos about it. And remember the wine guy, Gary Vaynerchuk? Gary Vaynerchuk, who gets 200,000 people a day watching his videos, does a blood tasting that day instead of a traditional video and puts it on YouTube and 200,000 people see it. And the next thing you know, millions of you know, impressions, if you can still call them that, across you know, the, the social sphere about this new TV show. The entire launch of this thing cost $50,000. And there was hardly any content. There was a mailer. There was a vial of blood. There was a direct mail letter. And there was a lot of sweat equity trying to identify the home addresses of the bloggers and the video bloggers. $50,000. You know, you can't buy a, a billboard in Manhattan for $50,000. Um, we need to change how we generate goodwill. This is a cool thing that we did at Mullen. So we had a client, and it's not an electric unicorn thing. We had a client, Grand Food Foundation, they wanted to give money to Feeding America. What did we do in the old days when we were giving money? Brands would do what they always do. Like we're going to write a check, we're going to write a press release, and we're going to pat ourselves on the back, and we're going to declare that we're really good citizens because we just gave money to a charity. Okay? Nice. Um, we basically said, you know, screw that. That makes no sense whatsoever. Let's do this. We're going to create a website. We're going to invite people to come and make art out of bread with videos and photography. When they make art out of bread, we're going to give them an avatar with it, whatever their image is. And they can put that on Twitter and they can put that on Facebook. And they can tell their friends about it. And for making that tiny little piece of bread art, we'll donate a dollar in their name to Feeding America. Right? Like I said, we were going to donate the money anyway. But why just donate money anymore in an age when people want to participate, 
when they want to do business and create content themselves, when they want to share, when they want to interact with a company that behaves like a human being, when they want to have a role, et cetera. So we ended up with thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces of bread art. Um, but the very cool thing about it was we went to Diane Sawyer, Good Morning America, and we told her about this story. And she made bread art on the site, and then she put us on the Good Morning America show. I assure you, if you wrote a press release and a check, you're not going on the Good Morning America show. But if you do something creative, then you might. And this goes back to what is the definition of creativity in this whole sort of new age. Uh, you know about Pepsi Refresh. That's a new way to create community value. Um, so there's some stuff that I think we should know about and learn about and do and embrace and get familiar with. But at the same time, what's amazing is this thing, all this stuff that we're talking about, the web and digital and, and social media and these new consumer behaviors and our iPhones, all that kind of stuff that we all depend on and use every day, they're like in its, their infancy, right? This stuff is like, YouTube's five years old. You know what, Facebook's four years old. I mean, this stuff, no one really knows what any of this means. It's just getting started. So all those things that I just told you are things that we should do, I might be completely wrong. And six months from now, you might be sitting here going, wow, that stuff he was talking about, that is, that is so ineffective and that's so passe and there's something new that's come along and changed it all. So now, what the hell do you do, right? You're sitting here going, shit, I'm supposed to be learning stuff because I'm going to go to work in a few months and I've got to be able to know what the heck I'm going to do. So I'm going to try one more tact on it, which is, okay, if those techniques and approaches end up being obsolete, my suggestion is there are, just like we talked this morning about curiosity for strategists, it's not... Where do you go to get stuff? It's what you do when you get there. And in this case, it isn't where you go to learn techniques. It's what you bring with you when you go there. And I think there's some things that we should bring. We should bring new skills, all of us. Regardless of what we're learning today, you know, I think we all need to learn new skills. Um, this, is, this is the new creative team right here, right? So. It's not a copywriter and an art director anymore. It's a copywriter and an art director and a web designer and a UX person and a programmer, a video producer, a content strategist, a connection planner, a PR social media person, media and analytics. <coughs> All these people have to somehow work together because nothing is simple enough anymore that it lives by itself. If you look at some of the stuff we talked about, some of those digital experiences and Art of the Trench, the bread art thing, it needs all of those functions. Shit. You know how hard that is to get to work together? How many people work in teams? Is it easy? It's, it's, it, even if you have the right objectives and you share the same <coughs> objectives, it's hard. So there's this thing that everybody talks about now. It's sort of pioneered by Tim Brown of IDEO. It's called the T-shaped person. And the T-shaped person means you need a specific skill that, is, that matters, that's marketable, that makes you valuable. But you need it to be horizontal as well. You need a really, really, really good understanding of all of those other disciplines, how they work together. You need to respect them and, and, and be able to leverage them and know how they relate to what you're doing so that what you do becomes more applicable and more valuable. So you may be a copywriter, but you better know something about APIs and HTML you know, and what you can do with you know, all the new platforms. So you may be a designer and be really good at making things beautiful, but you sure better know something about user experience because what looks pretty to your eye may not be you know, as functional as that user needs it to be. So um, T-shaped person. Second thing is new tools, platforms, and technologies, right? This is one of my favorite stories because this is an old copywriter, not as old as me, but an old line copywriter who didn't want to learn any of the new stuff and poo-pooed it all and thought that you know, making ads <laughs> was what it was all about. I'm a big believer that you cannot change behavior by changing opinions. You have to change opinions by changing behavior. And what I learned is if you get people to do things, they'll discover stuff on their own. Whereas if you just talk to them about it, they just think you're like full of hot air and you're blabbering away and no one wants to listen to you anyway. Um, so I got this guy excited about digital stuff. And then he did this thing, which I think is pretty cool. Now, if you're watching this right now, you don't have a webcam or you don't have a marker. This is the marker. It's a piece of paper that can be downloaded from this site. Take the marker, hold it up camera, and there you go. You have a full experience of what our camera looks like. This is actual size. 
Now, scroll over any of these yellow dots right here, and you can see down below, it tells you what it is. So this is the flash, click on it, and there's the flash. You can also see this camera has removable lenses and a big image sensor. There you go. So now there's a lot of stuff in, in QR codes and augmented reality that frankly is a bunch of crap, right? It's gimmicks, hold my coffee cup up to the webcam and get a picture of something, you know, a funny little movie. But it's not filled with utility and real applicability on something that we'll learn. And, and again, this is, this is the definition of creative when you go into the space. I'm not just going to do it because I can. I'm going to do it because, you know what, if I want someone to buy my camera, maybe it'd be really cool if I can give them a way to demonstrate it, use it, learn about it without having to make a gazillion sample cameras, but give them this little marker that sits inside a magazine, right? If you're a creative person and you get an assignment and the assignment is to sell cameras and to make an ad, you want to be able to go and think in that space as much as you might think about making something traditional. We need new ways of collaborating, right? So I talked about earlier, old creative team, and this was revolutionary when Burnback did that, right? But this might be what a new creative team looks like, or a new creative team, or a new creative team. And um, that isn't easy. And the hardest thing is because it's made up of two sides now that inherently don't get together, which is digital people and advertising people, software and storytelling. And they're from completely, totally different planets. Someone told me you guys are working together now with the business school, creative guys in the business school on something. And I bet you that that's like, whoa. Like, you know, the way that they evaluate stuff, the way you evaluate stuff, creative filter versus business filter, okay? Imagine now you're an artist and you're sitting there with a guy who writes code and, you know, you want them to be creative and they want you to invent something that can be made simply and elegantly and be functional. It's really crazy. Here's another thing that's interesting. <clears throat> you ever sit around, I know there's no alcohol here, which is a bummer, but <clears throat> <laughs> if you were toasting somebody, right, you got two people, it's really easy. It's one clink. But when you have four people, you're six clinks, right? It's always really hard. Oh, I didn't get you. I've got to reach across the table. Isn't it? Think of those as agreements, little contracts that have to be made in the world of collaboration. Two people, all we have to do is, you like my idea? I like your idea. Should we put our idea together? We get an idea, right? Good, right? All of a sudden, there's four of us. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I'm, uh, you know, way, way harder. Learning the skill of collaboration in the new world is, um, is, uh, is important. And um, I think your generation does it better than my generation inherently. But uh, I hope that's true. And then, of course, there's sex. Right? Anybody want to talk about sex? Or you want me to talk about sex? You ready to talk about sex? Sex is, I'm not really going to talk about sex. I mean, they probably, I, they probably throw me out of here. I'd be in deep shit. But, but all the new stuff is like sex, OK? Um, and it's like sex in this. Uh, you can watch videos about sex. And you can read about sex, but you don't really get it until you have it. You know what I mean? <laughs> so um, all this new stuff is exactly like that. You can't understand any of the things that I think are coming and that are new or that I'm talking about by listening to me talk about it. And you can't understand them by reading blogs about them. You can only get them if you do it. And what I found, because I've been reawakened and enlightened and liberated by those four guys that I showed you at the beginning, I found that this is magical and this is powerful and the stuff that we can do is incredible. And so you should use every one of these. You should be using Posterous and Instagram and Twitter and Quora and Storify. How many people know what Storify is? One. Anybody Can else? Talk yeah. about Storify just a moment. Storify. So, Especially um, for the and then see know. that little app thing over there? There's a, there's a thing called App Maker. And you can go on App Maker and you can make an iPhone app. And the hardest part isn't making the app, the hardest part is actually figuring out how to, de how to register as an app developer. Um, but you can go make an app, right? I mean, you don't have to know how to write code. That's a whole other thing. I have a problem with us not knowing how to write code because we're all getting programmed by other people who are telling us what constitutes an online profile and what, what, a, what a deck should look like when you make a presentation. Um, but, uh, but you should go around this stuff anyway. So Storify, very simply, this is really more interesting uh, to journalists, but, um, but maybe to you guys too. Storify is this new interesting platform. 
invented by a journalist, by the way. Who's, who, how many journalists here? Any journalists? Journalism? Oh, good, good, good. Okay, so Storify was invented by a journalist named Bert Herman. And Bert Herman concluded that, wow, you know what? Even if you can't verify the veracity of a lot of stuff in social media, what's happening in social media is often news. What somebody said may or may not be true, but the fact that they said it is a fact. Okay? The tweets that happened in Egypt on January 18th are sourceable content to talk about how those events materialized. So he, he actually worked, went and found some software guys. This is another interesting thing. A journalist who knows nothing about digital software or anything finds some, has an idea. He goes and gets some software guys, and they build a thing called Storify. What Storify is is a cool platform <coughs> that lets you do reporting online. And it's very simple. On one side of the screen, there's a column. and the left side of the screen, there's a column. On the left side of the screen, you can bring in anything you want. You can bring in Twitter. You can search by keyword and bring in Twitter. You can bring in Facebook. You can bring in YouTube. You can do a Google search. You can find a subject. You can go to the New York Times. You can grab any, anything and bring it up in that column, filter it in any way you want. And then you can say, OK, I'm going to build a story. The story I'm going to build is going to be, I'm going to tell the story of, of what's happening in social media related to Egypt. So you know what? I'm going to grab this piece from the New York Times. I'm going to drag it over here. And I'm going to grab, oh, here's five tweets that are really interesting. I'm going to grab these and drag them over here. And I'm going to grab this and drag them over here. And on the right-hand column, and then with just drag and drop, I can reorder everything. And I can press another button, and the window opens, and I can annotate what I just put in there. And I can end up writing a story that has quotes and sources and my own editorial comments, along with this other stuff that I, that I find. Um, and then I can hit a button and publish it, just like that. And the community can see it and can be online, et cetera. What I find really interesting is if I were a student, I would be looking at that and go, oh my god, this is like such an awesome research tool. Because I can organize, I can do research on any subject. I can grab all the stuff. I don't care whether I get it from Britannica or Wikipedia or literature, et cetera. And I know what all the journalists are going to say, oh, you know. First of all, how do we know if that content's any good? And maybe it isn't. And how do we know if it's, you know, valid? And maybe we don't. But, you know, you can probably, uh, you can probably still, you know, do your own reporting, right? I can ask a question on Quora or I can ask a question on Twitter and people can give me <coughs> answers. Those answers may or may not be accurate, but they're quotable sources of content for what it was that I asked somebody as if I were actually just interviewing them. So it's a really interesting thing. Now, again, that was invented for journalists to do reporting using social media. I believe someone else is going to figure out a different application for it, i.e. research, i.e. students, i.e. training young kids who have poor executive management skills to develop better executive management skills. Because 90% of all the stuff that's been invented was never invented for what we end up using it for. Twitter was not created to do what we do with Twitter. No was Facebook, no was YouTube. YouTube started as a dating site, right? And then they realized, well, this is no good. You this video dating thing, so let's turn it into a video site. And it became what it is. Um, podcasts, right, were invented by users, not by Apple. So, um, so anyway, check these things out. Learn them. Get good at them. Create in them. Uh, think about them. So I'm going to close with a story. This is one of my favorite stories. If you've read my stuff, you may know this story. Are there people who know this story? I hope there's somebody who don't know this story. Okay. Um, this story has nothing to do with digital or social media, um, but I found it online accidentally. You ever play with a stumble upon button when you're bored, right? I mean, now, now we're all playing with Angry Birds instead. But before Angry Birds, <laughs> we would go on stumble upon it. We'd hit the button a few times and we'd see what popped up. So one day this thing pops up and I go, wow, look at that. It's like this teeny little like, cardboard robot. What the hell is that? So I do a little bit of research, and I find out this thing is called a tween bot. Okay? And it was created by a woman who was a graduate student at a tisch school at NYU called Casey Kinzer. And she's studying urban migratory patterns and how people move around in the city. And she does this little thing. She builds this little robot, and she puts a pole on it with a little flag. And the flag says where the robot wants to go. So, and she takes it and she sticks it on the streets of Manhattan or in Central Park, and she goes away. She has her video camera and she just leaves it. And this little robot just starts to go all by itself, right? Except it falls off the curb or it bumps into a trash can or it hits a bench. And lo and behold, what happens? Someone comes along and goes, oh. And they come over and they get the little thing and they read the sign and it says who wants to go in and they say, oh, you're going the wrong way. And they turn it and then the little thing goes off, off again <laughs> and it you know, bumps into somebody else and somebody else comes along and helps it again. Now, she's done this thing 50 times. 
And sometimes she has this little robot, it's going to go a mile away, other side of Central Park, right? The interesting thing is it always gets to its destination, always. And nobody messes with a little robot. No one kicks him into the street, no one steals him, nobody puts him in the trash can. The little robot always gets to where it wants to go. Now, there's an advertising metaphor in this too. If you gave this assignment to an ad agency and said, hey, we got a little robot, we need that robot to get from here to there, you know what an ad agency would do? Car service. <laughs> or, um, you know, or they take out an ad campaign recruiting somebody to do it. But the new mindset says, you know what? I can get other people to do stuff for me if I embrace these five fundamental ideas. One, I can accomplish big things if I break them down into lots of little parts, lots of little pieces. Not unlike Eric Pru raising money for lemonade a dollar at a time. Not like, unlike uh, Sheena Mathaik in the Uniform Project raising $100,000 five dollars at a time. I can accomplish something big if I break it down into little pieces. Okay? Second thing, I can get people to participate and do things with me and for me if I give them some psychic reward. Right? So what's my psychic reward? My psychic reward is, wow, I helped that little robot get to its destination. And I'm part of a community of people who did that. And I feel really good about helping that little robot you know, get to where uh, it wants to go. The third thing is you make it really, really easy and effortless, right? Oh, shit, man. If I had to like actually take that thing and put it in my car and drive it there, I'm not going to do that. Screw that. All I have to do is turn it a little bit, point it in a different direction, and it goes. Fourth thing is, don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to ask. We all sometimes just forget to ask. Hey, can you do this for me? I need you to do me a favor. Can you tweet this? Can you retweet this? Can you send this? Can you post it? Can you respond to this? Can you click this? Can you like this? Can you get this badge? Whatever. And the fifth thing is, the little tweet button has a smile on his face, right? And I think the last thing that we need to do is we need to do things with joy, and we need to do things with passion, and we need to do things with enthusiasm, because that's what people want to be part of, right? It's no different than that girl, Michelle Laudo, saying, let's strike across New Jersey because we need money in schools, which, by the way, wasn't, you know, ha that happened on Facebook. And is it any surprise that four months later, Zuckerberg gives all that money, right? No one's ever put that together, you know, that, that, that little thing that she did. Um, but, uh, but um, you know, that's a big part of it, so those five things. And if you sum that all up, the conclusion you come to, going all the way back to the beginning, when we talked about Walter Cronkite and Ed Sullivan and those individual forces and stars in the media world, they were these one people who had, you know, all the power. And now we do all this stuff together, right? And I think it's the end of us and them. And I think that the takeaway is we should embrace this, learn it, get good at it, because all of us are better than one of us. And so think about that kind of stuff, what you can do with it. You know, go be social, make great stuff. I hope some of this was useful. Thank you. I'm more than glad to chit-chat or ask questions. But yeah, so what we want to do is get some questions going and want to make sure that uh, we, we have time for that. So let's do that for a little while. And um, uh, am I right? When we leave, we're going through these doors? Okay. So um, questions? Yes. Uh, <coughs> I just got some water. I would say that worked, and and you know if it works, that's great. And 
don't take all of this without a grain of salt, right? I mean, uh, but you know what else happened? What else happened this year for the first time ever? Half the Super Bowl spots were released in advance, right? No one ever did that. It was like the biggest secret in the world. Oh my God, you got to watch to see, right? So I'm not saying anything I say here doesn't mean the antithesis of it is irrelevant or not applicable. It just means we're moving away from that stuff exclusively into some of these new things. So, absolutely, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, the more you figure things out, try things, and experiment, the more you'll have the judgment to decide. You know, when you shouldn't shouldn't do it a certain way. You know. Does that count? Yeah, that counts. It counts in a it's a it's a less deep way, but yeah, that counts. You know, I'm just giving you the chance to express yourself and share it with friends, right? Pass it on. We talked about that at lunch, right? So yeah, there's degrees to all of this kind of stuff, and there will be detractors for many of these points and arguments, right? People saying, no, 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 you know, we don't want to give up control. We want to remain control. We can decide what's the best, you know, content to produce and the spot to run, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But, um, but I'm talking trends here more than anything. I'm not talking the de facto anything. I'm just talking where I think things are going. That's, that's all I'm talking about. But I just think you guys should be open-minded and, and, and be aware of this kind of stuff as well, you know? Yeah, Dave. Great, by the way, Andrew. I really enjoyed that. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Um, so here's a dilemma. You know, as I talk to my class, and a lot of them hit me up to come up to the agency in Portland and they want to intern and I'm really excited about it. Um, I'm not going to denigrate my agency and where I work, but there is that struggle about how do you keep that, the enthusiasm, the passion, and the joy that you're talking about, how do we retain that when the young folks join the agency? Yeah, you know what, and th this is, I, I could not agree more, and I think that, um, I think it's a challenge everywhere, too. Uh, I just met a young journalist who, uh, he was writing for a blog, and he was interviewing me for something, and, and someone had told me I should do the interview because he'd been a reporter for a daily newspaper in Boston, a big, big newspaper. And and the first thing I did when I got on the phone is I said, I'm going to interview him. So what the hell are you doing working for this blog, for this, when you were a reporter for a newspaper? And his response was, oh, my God, it sucked working for a newspaper. These guys were dinosaurs. They had their heads up their butt. They wouldn't let me engage with my readers. They didn't want me to interact. There was a hierarchy of how things got approved and who got to make decisions. And I felt like it was just the antithesis of everything that I see going on as a recent student, a content creator, you know, being somewhat digital savvy, et cetera, and <coughs> he feels liberated working for a blog, right? So the point is, this is true uh, across lots of industries, and you'll, you could very well end up in an agency where you go, oh, shit, all that stuff that we were talking about in school, I'm not even getting to do, and I'm doing some crappy job over here, and nobody wants to listen to me, and I have this really cool mobile example, and I'm going to bring that in the room, and I'm all excited about it. It's such a great idea, and the creative, object, creative director just rejects it out, out of hand, you know what? <clears throat> that is going to happen, I'm sorry to tell you. It happens inside my agency all the time. I can't even make it not happen when supposedly I'm one of the, one of the big, big cheeses. Um, so what somebody said to me, a guy named, I, I gave his name this morning, Mal Bonington. He's a big cheese at Google, Ben Malvin. What he said to me is, you know what? We all need to be, if we believe in the stuff, we care about the stuff, we all need to be pirates and hackers and outlaws. And what we need to do is we need to change the system. Sometimes we need to change the system from inside. You may go to be lucky and go to work for companies that get it. If you go to work for a digital shop, they're going to get it right away, a, a digital creative shop. If you go to work for a cool agency like, you know, Wyden and Kennedy, they'll, they'll get it in some corners of the company. If you, if you go to work for a company like Mullen or, or a company like Shiat Day where supposedly we get it and find out, wow, I'm working on a piece of business where nobody gets it, 
Um, you know, and everybody's old fashioned and thinks the old way. That's just a fact of life. But I will tell you, unarguably, that this is in one degree or another where everything's going, and it's going to just keep going fast. <coughs> so you have a few choices because you don't have a lot of selection early on. Like people who have a little bit of a career now, they go, "Well, I'm leaving this place because it sucks. I'm going to go someplace else where I know they get it." Other people, when you're looking for your first job, you may not have quite that much liberty. So you want to you want to go someplace where you where they at least have high standards. You can learn stuff. You can get to do something and. And maybe they're going there, maybe they're going too slowly, and you you just got to figure it out. You know, I I, th I think, you know, and, but you can try to evaluate that when you when you talk to people. Um, there's, I think, I don't know, don't you think there's more, more people starting to get it all of a sudden, don't you yeah, think? Yeah, I think, I think there is, and, and what I've been trying to say to my guys is um, it's time for them to start interviewing the company. Uh, I totally agree with that, yeah. You know what? Uh, I'll go talk to Alex, come up with an idea, have him raise some money for you to start your own company. You know? Do what she needs. I've actually seen a lot of kids in Boston get out of schools like Emerson and BU, et cetera, and I've even offered them jobs, and their editor is, I don't want to come work for you. I'm going to start my own company. Well, what are you going to start? You don't have any clients, you don't have any money. He says, okay, I've got a laptop, I have an apartment, I have a laptop, I have a partner, he has a laptop in his apartment, and they've got this thing called the internet. Um, <laughs> right? It's a multi billion dollar infrastructure that's free for most of us. Um, and shit, you know, go go create something, you know, if you can afford to live. Um, I'm working on a team uh, for that's working with Disney for JC Penney, and I was just wondering, you talk about a lot how instead of telling people what you know about a certain brand or something, you want to let them experience it. But when you let them experience it, do you turn that into an advertisement, or is it more special? Oh, that's a good question. No, you could. You very well could. I mean. You very well could turn that into a, uh, an advertisement. That's sort of what like um, Old Spice did, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they got people to tweet, then they took the tweet, then they turned it into a thing, and then it, be, it became something. The other thing is you could, you could anything that you do, or, you, you know the, the wheat thins thing, right? Like There's a perfect like example, people? okay? I don't know how contrived that was or not, but it doesn't really matter. It certainly looks real, so right? People check on Twitter to see if someone's going, oh, man, I need wheat thins. The wheat thins truck shows up. Say, hey, we read on Twitter that you need wheat thins. They deliver cartons and cases in a truckload of wheat thins, and they video the whole thing. And then, of course, they run it as an ad. So everything is everything else. Do you know what I mean? And I think that's a really smart way, a really smart way of thinking, right? So creating content all the time. And, um, and, and so that experience gets turned into something. We didn't even talk about mobile and QR codes and sticky bits and, <coughs> and how you can you know, embed content in the middle of your products now across all that kind of stuff. But in my opinion, all that stuff fits underneath the consumer behaviors. They're just different technologies and tactics that reinforce that. But Would you think on top of that, um, just if you didn't tell anyone about your project type of thing and it was more of like letting the user actually discuss it more, that would be, I guess, not more like... There's a, there's a uh, yes, and there's a challenge still, which is so the VW Force gets out there, that TV spot, and has 23 million views after a few days, and it had 12 million views before it even aired on the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. By any stretch of any imagination definition, that would be a success. It probably got those views in part, though, because there was press coverage talking about Super Bowl commercials, mm -hmm. right? The fact of the matter is, still things don't scale as quickly as advertising can make them scale. Big budget, mainstream media, while it may not necessarily you know, work all the time, the one thing it does afford you is fast, instant scale if you can afford it. There's much more waste than there used to be, but that's one advantage of it. Other things, if you get the Frank Rose book, it tells a story about, what is it, year zero? Anyone know the Nine Inch Nails story, how they use transmedia? It was called Year Zero or something? This thing became gigantic. So Nine Inch Nails wanted to launch a new album. They did it entirely with social media. And they started it by doing nothing but this, at a concert in a woman's restroom in an arena on the back of one door to a stall. They taped a jump drive. That's it. That's all they did. Someone goes in the stall, sitting on the thing, sees the jump drive taped to the door, goes, oh, I'm going to take the jump drive. They take the jump drive. They take your jump drive, they bring it home, they stick it in their computer, they look at what's on the jump drive, some cryptic coded something or other, 
she doesn't really know what it is. And then she sends it to a few other people saying, hey, I think what this thing is. And no one sort of really knows. And then one day, someone who got, this is maybe a few months later, someone who got the stuff emailed to them is at a concert, a Nine Inch Nails concert, and realizes that one of the band members is wearing something on his sleeve that connects to that thing that was inside the jump drive. And all of a sudden, this one person goes, oh, oh, that's connected to that. And this person goes back online and starts to chat about it. And the next thing you know, there's hundreds of people trying to dissect this thing and figure it out. And the next thing, and it goes and it goes and it goes and it gets bigger and it gets bigger and it's bigger. And it gets crazy. It gets to like, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. Now, granted, that's a very small, crazy, intense Nine Inch Nails, you know, customer thing. But it's like, whoa. I don't know if anybody knows the story about the Wired magazine writer <coughs> who tried to go off the grid. Right? I mean, this is gaming dynamics, right? This is group gaming dynamics. And this is another whole thing to do. Now, if I want to reach 100 million people, group gaming dynamics started with a jump drive in the back of a laboratory door probably is not the most effective media strategy. It may be inexpensive, but it's never going to get me my mass. But if I create the right partnerships, the right alliances. OK, so Brand Bowl, when we started Brand Bowl three years ago, I don't know, we got like a couple of thousand people to tweet, okay? And then last year we got maybe, you know, we got 100,000, you know, tweets. And then this year we said, you know what, let's try to find a media partner. So we went after the Chicago Tribune and all the Tribune things. They, didn't, well, they couldn't get through their own, you know, hierarchy and complication. We ended up doing it with Boston.com and the Boston Globe. So they brought us scale because what did they do? They wrote about it. They advertised it. They gave us free space. They gave us newspaper ads. They put it on their online website nonstop, you know, encouraging people to come and participate in this thing. Holy cow, the thing was through the roof this year. I mean, we had, we had like 350,000 tweets. We had thousands of people using the hashtag. For the entire night, we were the second or third top trending topic on Twitter worldwide, right? Not US, worldwide, the hashtag. And the number one trending topic was paid, right? So essentially, we were the number, for part of the night, we were the number one trending topic on Twitter worldwide, right? from something that started out as a little viral thing, invitation to people in the advertising business to learn to use Twitter, you know, because we added that leverage, which, which is, and again, so think about the combination of all the stuff coming together, so. You know what, I, I'm timekeeper. So let's take, uh, let's take two more questions, and then I know some of you will have one-on-one uh, -on -one questions, and we'll make the best use of time. Because I'm hungry and thirsty. And you're still on East Coast time. So and I'm still hungry. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I know you're not a journalist. But, uh, I was, though. A bad one, but I was. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was just wondering what you thought about the future um, I think I read the New Yorker cover to cover every week. In my family, my wife gets her own New Yorker, and I get my own New Yorker, so we don't fight over the New Yorker. And we both still read long-form journalism. I don't think as many people are going to read long-form journalism, but some people will always read long-form journalism. Um, and, uh, and it's like anything else. People start reading when they're interested, and they stop reading when they're not interested. So if you're a really, really good reporter, and you write really well, and you're a great storyteller, then people will, will read. But you know what? I think that, unfortunately, it's not going to, um, it's not going to ever be as popular with the masses as it, as it once was, because we're all distracted, and we have this thing called links. And we click on them. And the next thing you know, we're off on some journey to God knows where, right? <laughs> and we forget where we even started. Um, but, um, but I was a writer before I was anything. And, and, and I tell people this all the time. If you want to write long form copy, go do it. If you're a writer and you're a good writer, you never, ever have to worry about anything. It's one of the greatest skills in the world to have. You'll always be employable. So at least you have that. Yeah. Um, I have a question on that. You, you mentioned like Sherry Vanderchuk and stuff about creating your own, marketing your own thing. You started out on his own and everybody else, um, as well as like Tim Ferriss marketing his own book. Um, do you think that a lot of other agencies will not be as relevant anymore as people start to market their own things or out, you know, outsource their own? Yes, I do. I do think they'll be less relevant. I think that we're seeing new models already seeing like Victors and Spoils and John Windsor with a crowdsourced agency. 
We're seeing things like co-collaborative, Ty Montague's thing in New York where he's creating new kinds of alliances. Um, we're going to see everything's, things could change even more dramatically than we even think. Um, clients are of the mindset that, you know what, they don't necessarily want to hire agencies the same way they used to. They don't want long-term contracts. They don't want retainer fees. They'd rather do projects. They're not sure anymore whether or not they should be moving money out of traditional media and putting it into social media. You know, they, they, they're hearing people like me talk. I'm inside the industry, and I'm talking about the cool stuff that's happening outside the industry. So a client looks at that and goes, shit, he works for an agency, and he's telling us all this other stuff works. Why should we hire him? <laughs> Why should we hire him? Uh, so, yeah, I think there's going to be – we can't even <coughs> anticipate the changes that are coming, right? I mean, if we, if we knew anything about the future, AOL would have invented Facebook, right? Kodak would have invented Flickr. The New York Times would have invented Twitter. Um, ad agencies, um, Jesus, can you believe that a credit card company didn't invent Groupon? I mean, it, it, that's insane, right? I mean, that is the that, – when you look at that now, you go, how did a credit card company – not invent Groupon, right? All they're doing is that, you know, getting the power of the crowd to drive and, and the credit card company has millions of customers and they've got relationships with the, with, the, with the retailers and the vendors. What were they doing, right? So the point is, we have no idea what's going to happen. We only know that it is going to keep happening and it's going to keep happening fast. And yeah, ad agencies are going to slowly, if not go out of business, they're definitely going to morph into something different, right? One thing that's scary being in Vaynerchuk now is the ad agency. I mean, ah, not really, but yeah. I mean, he, he does consulting and he has his media, you know, Vaynerchuk media. So I think people that find ways of doing it well will be in demand because no one, a lot of people that's true. Yes, do that's yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there always will be a demand, I think. It's just coming up with being credible to do it. Yeah, you may do all the same stuff you're talking about. You just may do it in a different way for a different kind of person, maybe inside a company rather than for an agency, you know? Um, so. so I tell you what, we'll let, uh, we'll let Edward sign autographs for about 10 minutes, and then uh, 